Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session in American English Live Series 14. We are so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Kate, and I'll be with you today, along with my colleague behind the scenes, Elena, who will be the moderator, helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session today. Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Social Emotional Learning for Multilingual Learners, Fostering Growth with Luis Javier Penton Herrera and Hilda Martinez Alba. So Diana in Pakistan wrote, it was an awesome webinar. I've got some more ideas on how to motivate and engage my students. I think that using SEL activities makes learning more interesting and easier. Wonderful. And from Ernest in Albania, this session was really beneficial. It gave me a different insight to the importance of including SEL activities in the ELT classroom. Where I, where I work, students have been impacted not only by the coronavirus, but also an earthquake. And these strategies could really help me, help, excuse me, help them feel more relaxed and supported. Thank you so much for that wonderful comment, Ernest. And we hope that you are doing well as well as your students. And Henry Jeronimo in Nicaragua says, I had some ideas of how SEL works in the classroom, but this webinar put all my doubts behind me by offering explanations, examples, and activities that can be so helpful for teaching and learning. Wonderful. So we love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering feedback through the end of session quiz form or by emailing your ideas to American English webinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your uh, comments during the next webinar. So throughout series 14, we will explore the themes of social emotional learning, SEL, multi-level classes, and English for specific purposes, teaching about climate change in the EFL classroom. We hope you will be able to use the practical ideas we share. So here's what to expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. And when our session comes to a close, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click, click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you've successfully done so, you can expect to receive your badge via email within about a week. Are you see seeking creative ways to teach your students how to analyze and critique information they receive from media sources, such as news outlets and social networks? If so, join English for Media Literacy for Educators, a free MOOC or massive open online course that will prepare you to provide media literacy instruction for students of various ages and levels of English proficiency. To learn more and enroll, visit the link being shared in the chat and comments now. Enrollment closes on June 28th and all coursework must be completed by July 5th. And now let's begin today's webinar, Understanding Culturally Responsive Social and Emotional Learning in Language. Why is culturally responsive social and emotional learning, SEL, important in ELT classrooms? As educators, we understand the importance of leveraging our students' cultural backgrounds and the value SEL has on students' lifelong trajectory. SEL helps develop the skills needed in facing adverse situations building healthy relationships, and making positive choices. In turn, these skills affect academic success. During the webinar, we will explore tips for implementing SEL practices in online and in-person spaces, address SEL competencies using a culturally responsive lens, modeling SEL classroom strategies to engage all students, and we'll reflect upon the community of context and lived experiences that shape our personal understandings of SEL, as well as considering how to develop a self-care plan. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Erica Saito. 
Erica is an assistant professor and course lead in the Master's in Social, Social and Emotional Learning and Master's in Education with an SEL emphasis at National University, Sanford College of Education. She also serves as the university's subcommittee chair in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Erica previous, previously taught in Pepperdine University's Master's in TESOL and Teacher Credentialing programs. She also spent 15 years as a classroom teacher, literacy teacher on special assignment, and sheltered programs department chair in public and private institutions in California. She is currently K-12 level chair for CATESOL, secretary elect for ERA's SEL special interest group, associate editor for Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies in Education, and article editor for issues in teacher education. Welcome, Erica. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Kate, for that kind introduction. Welcome to AE Live Series 14. Again, I'm Erica Saito, and I'm thrilled to have all of you join me today for this professional development session on culturally responsive social and emotional learning, or SEL, in language classrooms. I personally enjoy teaching SEL or social emotional learning in English through a culturally responsive lens to, to respect and give appreciation to the students I serve. Teaching is my heart and my passion, and I'm also someone who wants to learn equally for my students. I believe they bring value to the class that cannot be taught within textbooks or literature. So knowing this, let's talk about the goals of the session. Today, we will explore welcoming and inclusive SEL practices, followed by a review of SEL frameworks. We'll dive into culturally responsive SEL with the focus on identity development. We'll also have an opportunity to connect our SEL skills with our lived experiences in community. And finally, we will end with self-care. So let's begin with a warm welcome. I invite each of you from around the globe to join me in this virtual space by starting this session with a warm welcome from me and a check-in. How are you feeling as we begin the webinar? So drop in the chat an emoji, words, or anything that it might express the feelings that you're entering with. And let's take a minute to gain a temperature check of our participants. Yeah, thank you. And please go ahead and answer this question in the chat. I'm seeing um, one person who says they're exhausted after a long day. We have a few people saying they're excited. Christina, Malika, Siddhi says happy. P. Mitchell says a little tired, but interested in this session. Great. We're seeing some wonderful emo emojis as well. We have a lot of people saying I'm excited, <laughs> uh, curious, interested. Diana says <laughs> excited. A lot of excitement. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of excitement. You wouldn't believe, and lots of big emojis with big smiles. So that's very exciting. And Katie says she's thrilled. Wonderful. Thanks for Thank sharing that, everybody. Thank you. And I, I know some of you are feeling tired today, this evening, afternoon, wherever you are. And so I am truly grateful for all of you joining today, in spite of these feelings. So let's go on to a warm welcome. What is a warm welcome? A warm welcome is an opening practice, a ritual, a routine that's planned ahead of class, and it provides purpose. This practice should be quick and allows you, as the teacher, to quickly scan all of the emotions that students are entering with. This means that your warm welcome or check-in should occur at the beginning of class before instruction begins. Let me share why a practice like a warm welcome or a check-in is needed. So check-ins like the one you just completed, it adds uh, to a supporting and inclusive classroom environment that welcomes all students. It builds a sense of belongingness for students and in turn, they feel more invested in their own education. Since all students' emotions are seen or heard through this practice, it creates a welcoming environment and students are learning how to identify and navigate their emotions and begin with a routine that supports and creates a more positive mindset, which in turn limits disruptions during class. So in addition, having this practice at the beginning of the day provides opportunities for students to feel connected or engaged at the start of class. 
In the next few slides, I will be sharing a few examples of check-ins that can be adapted for online as well as in person. So this is a snapshot of four variations of check-ins, all of which can be adapted by language level and age or grade level. And these include enter tickets, some color-coded cards, journaling, and forms. As we go through these activities, think about best practices that work for the size of your class as well as space. Not every activity will work well with a large class or even a small class. So let's take a look at enter tickets. So I call this practice an enter ticket because just like an exit ticket, it's a quick scan of students. But instead of checking what students have learned at the end of the day, we are learning how students are entering our classroom. Since you're checking their tickets as they enter, this works well with any class size. So I recommend that it's on a small piece of paper that is prepared in advance with a simple open-ended question for students to answer. So on this slide, I've provided three variations that can be used based on age or language level. So if you don't have time to prepare something like this in advance, a simple question in front of the class on a board would also work. If you're teaching online, placing the question on a slide just like this for students to respond to in the chat would also work. And what I would do is skim through the responses as they're submitting them to check if there's any red flags where you'll need to follow up with a student one-on-one. -on -one. I've worked with thoughtful teachers who've come up with creative ways of collecting their enter tickets. And that some have created a space where they complete the ticket as they enter the class and place it into a box, like a mailbox at the classroom door. Others have put it into a jar or a tray to drop in their tickets, but I highly recommend checking as students are completing them and handing them as they enter the classroom. I do know that many of you are busy and you might wanna hold off until students are assigned an independent task or a quick break at the beginning to check, but if it's taking too long for you, it may not be a good check-in for your class. But remember the key is to quickly gauge how students are feeling as they enter. Wonderful. Second we example have a nice is, quick, a oh, quick comment sorry. from Balgis Ben Zabe, who says, I feel connected with your with students and it starts the class with a positive energy. So feeling connected makes it uh, a nice beginning. So he agrees with you that these are great strategies. And I agree with you as well. That's wonderful. It's wonderful that you're already engaging in them, which is Wonderful to hear. So a second example of this is a color-coded card or some sort of sticky note to physically post their check-in on a wall or some other shared space. And this can be created with color-coded cards. Um, you can also draw them or have students draw faces on them. And this works well with a large class size where they can quickly scan how students are feeling and they would just share like this, lift up, um, so the teacher can quickly scan the room. So the image that you see, this picture that's kind of small, is a door from a summer classroom English class um, that I taught. And I use sticky notes with student thoughts. And they loved being able to express themselves and leave them at the door. So in this case, students have the choice um, of being anonymous. So they didn't have to write their names on it if they didn't want to. Um, and at the beginning, I bought, modeled this practice and provided an example on the board with a sentence stem for students to complete. You can keep a list of adjectives to describe the range of feelings or use a color coded mood meter to help within a week students were automatically writing their own sentences with very little direction. And those at the upper intermediate um, through advanced level can write more expanded sentences like what you see on the right to explain why they might feel this way. A third example, which I think is great for all ages and levels is a journal or some sort, sort of form of writing that can be completed either online or on paper to self-reflect and self-evaluate. It can be anything from a drawing or a brainstorm of words to a bullet point list or a brief narrative. And this is a great way for students to track their own progress since it's all stored in one place, which is their journal. At the end of each week, they can spend time rereading their previous entries and write a reflection on their week to promote their emotional growth as well. So in order to build trust and allowing students to feel more open in expressing themselves, I highly recommend that this activity is not graded for gram grammar. Students need a space 
where they can creatively and openly write their thoughts without having the fear of their grammar being checked. So the image that I have on this slide are my former students' journal covers. They chose whatever they felt reflected them and their personalities, which range from cartoon characters to their favorite pop and rap stars. Something as simple as this makes them feel personally connected to school and also provided me an opportunity to learn about their interests. For developing a positive mindset using a daily gratitude journal with a brief reflective question or questions can help. And I've provided a few prompts that include things like make a list of the important people in your life, explain why they are important, write a thank you card to someone who has made a difference in your life. How do you show your appreciation? This is great. And I see a lot of positive comments coming in. We have one question from Nala. Um, what do you usually do with their responses? Do you um, respond to them also? Do you write back? How do you um, respond? So if, it's, if you're referring to the exit tickets, if there's anything that I need to follow up on, I would pull the student aside um, during a break or at some moment in time to do a one-on-one -on -one check. And I think that's really important to know and to show that you care and that you're reading these comments. If it's in a journal, I would recommend you can do a, a response to them, a written response to them back into their journal so it's more private. Um, so it depends on the context and space. If you have like 100 students in your class, it may not be doable, but at least doing some sort of indication to show that you've read it, um, I think is really important, even if it's a few words. Sounds good, thank you. All right, so another form of check-in is something that could be created on paper or online. And it's something as simple as filling in the blanks or checking off boxes for spaces for students. Um, the image that you have here is actually something I used when I was teaching online as a check-in with the different emojis. And for younger students, faces with words can be checked off um, or drawing their own face if it's on paper can be great. So I don't know if there's any questions so far, other questions that are coming through the chats before we move on. If not, I'm curious to hear from all of you. Uh, so if how do you welcome students into your classroom? Wonderful. Yeah. Ask what do you <clears throat> what do you usually do, everyone, to welcome all students into your classroom? Let us know. Let's take a look here. And if you're not doing any of these practices, is there one that you would like to implement or adapt? Yeah, Nalita says uh, welcoming students helps to build rapport. Absolutely. Let's see. Sachiko said, I taught some adjectives related to feelings and used sticky notes to um, have students share how they feel on that day. That's a great idea. Sarah welcomes the students by singing a song. Uh, many people say they they greet their students with a nice smile. Cynthia writes, I used to welcome my students by playing music to set the mood. And at the end of the semester, they would they would be so used to that that they would start to sing the song. <laughs> and Kasim says he uses icebreakers. And Edith says she asks them how they feel and how they did during the day. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Right. And remember, these are quick activities, so it shouldn't last more than five minutes. Um, and I think even five minutes could be even too much. So if it's something as quick as just showing how you feel or, you know, something very quick that you can lift up, something that you just click off and check in, uh, it really shouldn't take too much time because it's, it should be a quick practice before you begin instruction. All right. So thank you again for sharing these practices. So now that we're familiar with a, a key SEL practice, which is the warm welcome, let's take a step back to talk briefly about defining social emotional learning or SEL in its many frameworks. So when I think of the term social and emotional learning, several other terms come to mind, such as soft skills, non-cognitive skills, SEL, transferable skills, emotional intelligence, developmental assets, interpersonal skills, among others. There isn't a single unified or set definition of social and emotional learning because the competencies and skills are different based on the context. 
And I would like for you to keep this in mind as I talk with each of you about SEL and what SEL means to you and your students. So I know this chart looks overwhelming and I'm sharing this to show that there are many SEL frameworks that exist around the world. So this is not a complete list, it is a partial listing. And in order to fully understand social and emotional learning and the competencies tied to it, it's extremely important to understand that defining social and emotional learning is different based on country and cultural context. So for example, in some families, the way I understand self-awareness as a skill could mean that I'm fully aware of how my actions and my words impact how my community members see me or my entire family or how society perceives my community. In another cultural context, self-awareness could mean that I'm only aware of myself and only my emotions in the way I feel and I'm responsible for managing them as we have shared in our previous practice. But because of this, there is no single definition or no single SEL framework that perfectly fits every country and culture. So this image is from Harvard's Easel Lab, and it includes a partial list of SEL frameworks, again, from around the world, identified with six key areas, cognitive, emotion, social, values, perspectives, and identity. Okay, and this particular screenshot is showing the role of identity within SEL frameworks in purple. So please keep this in mind as we consider culturally responsive SEL. And to start, let's take a look at culturally responsive teaching. So what is culturally responsive teaching? Well, Geneva, Geneva Gay defines it as using the cultural characteristics, experiences, and perspectives of ethnically diverse students as conduits for teaching them more effectively. This means we're looking at students' backgrounds and experiences as a valuable resource and guide to teach our students. So how can we be culturally responsive teachers? Let's find out. So as I talk on this slide and, and the next slide, I would like to ask you to also take this as a moment to reflect and look inward on your current practices, your beliefs and biases of your students in the following categories. The first is commitment. Do you feel a sense of commitment to improve your students' academic performance? Second is skills. Do you have the skills to develop student relationships and understand how to incorporate their backgrounds into your teaching practices? And next are attitudes. Do you have a positive attitude of each of your students and respect their unique differences? And then there's thoughts. Do you create space for students to organize their thoughts and share their ideas? And lastly are the behaviors. Do you have high behavioral expectations of your students? Do you, as the teacher, keep a standard of behavior that you model for your students? And do these standards align with your cultural practices of your students? These are key reflective areas to be more culturally responsive. It starts with us in examining our practices with a constant idea in the back of our minds that we can always improve our teaching. So this next slide is more explicit in the way that we as teachers can be more culturally responsive. It starts with knowing our students and centering them in the process of their learning. So thinking about your knowledge of your students' home, community, and experiences. How are they brought into or connected into your curriculum? Think about how your students learn. How do you assist students in their construction of knowledge? The next is applying knowledge of students within teaching. What knowledge are they entering with? And what can be used to help guide your instruction? And remember to build on students' strengths. If you know your students, you know their strengths and how they can be used in the learning process. So let's pause for a moment to reflect on these practices. And if anyone has any questions, please do not hesitate. Yeah, we do have a nice question from um, Sachiko who says, I wonder what is the difference between attitude and behavior? 
Well, I think with the the attitude is your a lot of a lot of it is your perceptions and the behaviors could be physical. It could be um, your entry point into understanding students. Um, when we think of a classroom and the behaviors that students have, they could demonstrate like that they're tired, right, and put their head down. They might be sleepy. Um, with the attitude, it's our personal thoughts of our students. And in this case, our attitudes have a long-term effect on our students' academic performance for years years to come. Yeah, thank you so it much. Make it more confusing. <laughs> no, great. No, great question. I think attitudes are sort of inside, and behaviors are kind of outside. And sometimes our behaviors show what our attitudes are. <laughs> Um, let's see, Aaron, excuse me, Evan had a nice comment. Open-mindedness and embracing one's unique abilities eliminates divisiveness. Very nice. And just another quick comment um, that um, someone said, uh, I've never thought of ways to welcome my students and those are wonderful <laughs> from before. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, we can, can continue on. Thank you. And I, I think it's, it's important for all of us as educators to continually be open to different practices, right? That's how we develop. That's how we grow. So if you can, please share with me on a scale of one of five at this point, how you would rate your knowledge of your students' homes, communities, and experiences. So starting with one of no knowledge and five very knowledgeable. Yeah, let us know, everyone. And feel free to give us an explanation if you'd like to as well in the chat box. How would you rate your knowledge of your students' homes, communities, and experiences? All right, so we're seeing some varied responses here, five, four, and three. Let's see, Ms. Tolema says some knowledge. Gazala says a four, Frene says five. Hannah says two, very little knowledge. Rosemary says three. So I think we see a lot of variety. Cynthia says four, I always try to connect with my students. Right. And Natusha, Nat, Nastu, how says two, I have so many students, it's hard to know each of them. So great responses, everybody. Thank you for sharing. No, and I, I appreciate you being very honest with, with the responses too. And it's there's no judgment on my end if you said one or two. It's reality, right? This is this is what we're experiencing right now. So I appreciate that. Um, so we can move on to more about SEL competencies. And so after sharing a little bit about the cultural context of SEL frameworks um, and cultural responsiveness, the, competen the competencies that I will be using in this presentation are through CASEL's framework. And I realize that you were introduced to this framework in your last webinar. As you recall, CASEL, C-A-S-E-L, stands for the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Collaborative, yes. Um, and so I'm sharing this framework as it applies to students in K-12 spaces, and it's the main framework that's used in U.S. classrooms. So as a quick review, the competencies include self-awareness, social awareness, relationship building, responsible decision making, and self-management. Another key part are the settings of where social and emotional development take place. And according to CASEL, our classrooms, schools, families, caregivers and communities serve as a space where SEL occurs. So we're taking the traditional understanding of SEL through CASEL's framework and expanding it into culturally responsive SEL. We're looking at a change from a self-centered focus in traditional SEL to an interculturally focused, um, culturally responsive SEL. So to start, self-awareness is not only being aware of our emotions, but the ways it is supports our students' identity development. With social awareness, we're not just looking at understanding how other people feel or what people might call reading the room, but also being more civically engaged. With relationship building, it's considering the positive connections with our students and, and the connections they have with peers and other adults, but also considering the ways that we learn and connect with communities outside of our own. Responsible decision making is not only making a choice, but being mindful of the diverse perspectives that exist before making a judgment or making an informed decision. And lastly, with self-management, it is not only about managing your emotions, 
but understanding how to behave and respond based on cultural context. So considering these competencies, culturally responsive SEL begins with an exploration of one's identity. So let's take a closer look into identity practices. This web provides keywords connected to culturally responsive SEL, such as developing a larger emotional vocabulary, which some of you had shared, you know, your list of, of words, to be more accurate in the words that define their feelings, the feelings of others. Identity developments can include identifying and addressing one's own biases, and will be the core of this presentation, uh, providing opportunities to self-reflect and developing a positive mindset. So why is this or identity important? So with this iceberg image that might look familiar to some of you, it's typically used to understand language acquisition, I'm using it to address surface level and deep cultural knowledge and here I adapted it to surface level and deep level identity. Within the US context, surface level identity can include things like your name, how people greet you, your profession, family, age, hobbies, or interests. And these are broader ways to define or identify the depth of, of one's identity and culture. A deep cultural identity within a US context would go deeper into a personal identity that may include things like your ethnicities, the multiple languages that you speak, your nationalities, and beliefs. It could also include communi communication styles, the way we understand ourselves, and how we interpret specific expressions. All of these areas allow us to understand each other with greater depth and awareness. So in thinking about all of these things that can make up one's own identity, how does your identity shape your teaching practices? Let's take a moment to pause and reflect on this question and I invite you to share your thoughts in the chat. Yeah, let us know everyone. What do you think? How does your identity shape your teaching practice? What do you think? Let's see, I know that for myself, I bring my own experiences and thoughts into the classroom and I'm sure that that um, plays out. When I was teaching in the classroom, I used to use a lot of music because I love music so much. So that definitely affected my teaching practice. Rune May says gender affects teaching features, definitely. Christina says students are interested in my hobbies and would like to share their life, wonderful. Erin says sometimes identity um, shapes topic choices. Great, yep, absolutely. Nastuso says I'm very energetic and friendly, sometimes maybe too much, <laughs> and that affects her teaching practices. Um, it affects when you can mutually share, wonderful. And one more, um, Gabby says she likes to do teamwork. And so that definitely affects what she does. And one more, I'm sorry, from Blanca, our identity helps teachers to understand the context of learners cultures as well. You can kind of think about your own identity and then also reflect on your students. Wonderful, thank you for these great responses, everyone. Right, and I, I appreciate the range and diversity of, of all of the responses and experiences that you all have and what you bring into your classrooms. So thank you. I see if there's still some others coming into the chat. Well, I wanted to share this. Um, it's an identity sunburst graphic organizer. And this is one way to share a bit of our identity and I'm sharing mine with within our teaching. Um, and identity is something that continues to shape throughout our lifetime as we experience life. This activity can be delivered in a variety of ways. So please consider what works best with your students and cultural considerations. So the sunburst allows students to think of the ways they are identified among family and friends. And here is my example. So I started off with my name in the middle. You can draw a picture of yourself if you wanted to. And I was thinking, okay, the arrows that are pointing outwards are the words that describe me. The arrows that are pointing inward are how I think others describe me. So I think of myself as a mom, but you know, my mom, definitely thinks of me as a daughter, not a mom. Um, I feel that I am a caring person. I'm an educator and involved, 
but other people think that I am a busy person. Um, they call me a professor and sometimes a good listener. I would think most of the time though. That's just me. So that, that's just to share how, um, how you can use this form. And I'm sure there's other ways to adapt it as well. All right. So another question is, um, the usually that comes in is what to do next. So typically with graphic organizers, it's an organizer, right? It's helping organize your ideas. Um, but there also needs to be an application piece with any graphic organizer. So thinking about the next step. And in this case, there is a, a writing product and I would suggest something like an I am poem. And you may have some other interesting ideas as well. So here I just have a simple I am prompt and it can be developed in different ways. It could start with something like I am, like I am a mom, I am a daughter, um, but you could change up the language to see like how I see myself versus how others see me. And this next beautiful image is another activity that's called a me cube, me cube, and it's just made out of paper. You might see different variations of this, like an all about me poster, a me bag, or a me box. So within a bag or a box, students can decorate the outside with surface level identity interests and place an object or symbol of objects that represent them inside. I've had students write lyrics of their favorite song, a movie quote, and explain why they chose these to represent them. But you can decide what your students, what you want your students to include on each side. So some ideas include things like a self-portrait, so like my beautiful self-portrait, um, interesting facts, a list of their favorites, a future goal or goals, a favorite book or subject, TV show, hobbies, interests, or a favorite poem or song. And then there's also what you can do with it afterwards, right? So, so developing it a little bit further and understanding the various language levels that our students are entering with. So beginners looking at images, words, and phrases, intermediate expanding it a little bit more and creating a, a bullet point list. So I gave some examples here on the slide and in the advanced, it can be expanded more into sentences with explanations of why. And I, I just wanted to share this quote because I think it is is really important in relation to identity, and this is coming from Education Trust. Identity is the core of social, emotional, and academic development. So I want you to think and remember this quote. Keep it in mind. Um, the central role of identity, uh, what it has within our students' overall development. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what other activities can language teachers use to enable students to express and celebrate many parts of their identities? And I know a lot of you have some great ideas that you're already doing. Yeah, great question. And I see a lot of great comments about these examples you shared with us, but let us hear from you, everyone. What other activities can language teachers use to enable students to express and celebrate the many parts of their identities? What do you think? Let's see, Sachito likes the cube and says you can also do that by making a poster. I saw a lot of people commenting on how they liked the uh, Sunburst graphic organizer. Min Min says you could do a debate. See, he says you could visit their family. Rune says a language wheel. You could do um, a identities wheel on Padlet, wonderful. Let's see, create a portfolio or profiles or even have students create a CV. Kasim says you could do drawing. Cleary says role plays. Gabby says recognizing each person's skills. Having them write essays from Aitan. Student profiles and identity wheels from Gazala. So many great ideas. Thank you for sharing everybody. Thank you. All right. So identity is really connected to several parts of the interactions that we have with our students, as well as the interactions they have with each other. And by sharing these lived experiences and learning more about their experiences within their community, not only supports their identity development, but also the relationship they build with others, linking into greater social awareness. 
So social awareness and relationship building are two competencies and they overlap. And these two areas can be built through the following practices, which includes having or developing a growth mindset, inquiry-based instruction, opportunities for paired small group or whole group interaction, which I heard earlier, civic engagements, creating and maintaining an inviting space that allows for discussion, building on cultural awareness of not only themselves, but culture's difference from their own, opportunities to collaborate on projects and assignments, and making connections between peers, peers to peers, uh, peers to adults, and separately the connections they make to the literature and readings. So this is not a complete list of ideas tied to those competencies, but these are here to help um, build social awareness and relationship building through culturally responsive SEL. When we think back about the way these two different skills work together, it's also important to connect it back to what research tells us. A teacher's social awareness and relationship skills make a difference to students for years to come. And I know I mentioned this earlier, but there's studies, things on um, kindergarten teachers and how they perceive the relationships they have with their students affected behavioral and academic outcomes of students as far as into eighth grade. So imagine that. And other studies have shown that teachers that have a negative view of their students um, are less likely to succeed and less likely to show positive behaviors up to several years later. So how we perceive our students, how we think about them has a long-term effect. And I hope you think about the effect you have right now on your student success. So currently, um, are your relationship skills and social awareness stronger with your students or your colleagues? Why might that be? Let us know everybody, what do you think? Are your relationship skills and social awareness stronger with your students or your colleagues? And why do you think so? Let's take a look. I know with when I was teaching, I always sort of felt like my relationship skills with my students were stronger since I had more interaction with them. I didn't have as much interaction with my colleagues. Let's see, Jalema says it's stronger with her students. Malika says the same. Nala says, I put all my effort into my students. <laughs> so Gazala says with his colleagues. Wonderful. I think a it's lot really of the time, right? The yeah. Time with them. Absolutely. Yeah. And Edliberta says both. So I think, and Bafa says it depends. So I think we, yeah, I think you're right. It kind of depends on how much time you spend with each group. Thanks for sharing everybody. Thank you. All right. So I wanted to start off um, this with empathy interviews and empathy interviews are a one on one conversation with a person to have a deeper understanding of an issue. It's um, conducted to great to gain greater awareness and understanding of an issue or concern in order to find out ways to resolve it. And it's a great way to develop connections and trust with the person that's being interviewed. So as with any activity, that opens students up to sharing information. Setting empathy interview norms before you start is extremely important. And here are just some ideas. Making sure that students are entering with the mindset of learning, which we kind of mentioned earlier too. And during the interview, being fully attentive without any distractions. So don't look around or be distracted by things physically around you. Uh, be physically invested and interested. Do not interrupt the interviewee when the interviewee is responding. So if you want to ask an, inter, uh, an additional question in the middle of a response, try to avoid that. Um, do not cut off responses or challenge the response. The focus is really on the interviewee and the experiences that are being shared. And then lastly, ask open-ended questions. These will lead to greater conversation. So this is tied to both social awareness and relationship building. And now that you understand a little bit about what an empathy interview is and the norms that need to be created, let's look how these empathy interviews work. So empathy interviews can be questions that are developed by the students or by the teacher. These interviews can take place between student and students or even a student and family member. The questions should be centered on a, um, a central topic. And some example questions or prompts include, describe a time when you feel challenged and how you responded to it. 
or what helps you learn or tell me about a time you felt successful. So I don't know, Kate, if I asked you this question and we we're doing an empathy interview like this, can you describe a time when you faced a challenge and how you responded to it? Oh, let's see. I've had plenty. Um, let's see. Um, a time when I faced a challenge and how I responded to it. Um, I had a student who um, was not able to sit down for very long um, and always had to move around. And at first I felt very frustrated about that, um, but I uh, spoke with my colleagues and asked uh, some different strategies. And I also was able to get him some more support outside. And so I was able to just say, okay, you can walk around as much as you would like to. And um, that really helped as soon as, the more I accepted the issue, the better it became. Thank you, Kate. And so what I was trying to model within this practice was listening, not interrupting and giving my undivided attention, right? So I wasn't looking around, trying to touch other things. I'm looking straight at Kate while she's responding and listening. So thank you for sharing that and, and, and hearing how you're able to respond through the support of, of others. So remember that these are centered on experiences and provides a learning opportunity for your students to listen, to absorb information, and again, learning from their peers or family members. Okay, so, oops, oops, okay. Share, if you can, just quickly share an example of an empathy interview starter, a question that helps your class community learn about each other that might work well within your classes. Yeah, what's a question that you might ask your students um, or that you might have your students ask of each other that might help them knowing more about each other and that might work well in your class? What would be a good question? Tell me something new you learned about your friend. Very nice. Tell me about a difficult situation you went through recently, Bob Rothy. Nice. Let's see, just the question, how do you feel? Shazia, how was your weekend? Yeah, that might be a nice, easy way to begin a, a conversation. What is your first impression of your friend from Durga? Let's see. How do you feel today? Where do you live? What is something that makes you feel relaxed from Nasduho? And Mar Mariana says, tell me about your hobbies and interests. Those are great. Thank you so much for sharing, everybody. Thank you. I think these are great to just house somewhere. I would, I would like write all these down or save the chat some ways, <laughs> just so you can have a list of all the questions that you'd wanna ask. So what happens after an empathy interview? Um, what happens next, right? What do you do with this information? Well, the interviewer, the interviewer um, should reflect on their own interview. And some questions that they can ask themselves include, how well did I follow the empathy interview norms? Like, was I paying attention? Um, how do I understand my interviewee's experience? What are the challenges my interviewee experience? And what questions did I miss or would ask again in the future or why? Because sometimes when we're interviewing someone um, and we're asking these questions in a classroom, we just ask and then, you know, it's the assignment and that's it. But we should also take that step further and have time to self-reflect, right? What could we have changed or done differently? So I believe we are the harshest critics of ourselves. And if we truly know ourselves, we can certainly reflect on our ways to improve, right? But sometimes this amount of pressure to want to do everything, the secondary stress that we feel from our um, students' trauma, all of these things lead us as teachers in feeling stressed. And um, when feeling this stress, um, we tend to show lower levels of social adjustment and academic performance. And, and the ways that we're feeling, it starts really with self-care. I realize we have about 10 minutes or less, right? All right. So here's the, the quote from the Pennsylvania State University. When, when teachers are highly stressed, students show lower levels of both social adjustment and academic performance. So we'll start with the next slide on self-care. So what is self-care? And some people think that self-care is about buying something to make you happy or doing something that leads to something that's material, right? Like buying clothing or a new device, but that's not self-care, okay? Self-care are actually the healthy habits and taking action in preserving your overall health. And this can be sustained by creating a self-care plan, reflect on key areas, and understand ways to identify possible roadblocks. So let's dive into this topic on self-care a bit further. 
When creating a self-care plan, there are six key areas, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, professional. And, and as I'm reading this next slide and introducing these different sections of self-care, feel free to respond in the chat to any of the following questions um, and consider the ways that we can use these growth mindset and assertive modals. So rather than saying, mm, I'd like to, or I, I could do this, we wanna use something more assertive. I will, I have, I can, I am, right? All right. So here are some of the prompts for a self-care plan for you as well as your students. Um, so under professional self-care, in what ways do, do you develop professionally? How do you separate work and personal life? For students, you can just shift the focus on their, their student's um, role. For physical self-care, are you eating healthy and regularly? Do you take breaks? Do you take time off as needed? I feel like sometimes we don't, right? And under our emotional self-care, what activities or hobbies do you enjoy outside of work? Who do you turn to for support? Under spiritual self-care, how do you engage or reflect spiritually? And lastly, for relationship self-care, how do you maintain a healthy relationship with the people you care about? So I hope you keep a copy of this as a reminder to what you should be practicing and developing. So after completing your self-care plan, or if you have students engage in this sort of activity, encourage, of course, further interaction with your self-care plan. Everything I'm saying today is not just a one-time thing and then you just leave it alone. It's you do this and then you think of that next step, right? So I encourage you to, to, to write down your self-care plan, but also writing down your reflections um, using the following. So what are you currently doing? What are my current practices? What can you do to improve? Are there practices that aren't working or things that I'm saying I want to do but not doing? And how can I make this change? Post this visibly. So put it somewhere on your wall right next to you or right on top of your desk um, and review it regularly. It's important to keep it in a place where you can actually stare at it and look at it and don't hide it beside something else, okay? It should be clearly visible. So remember self-care is a way to address and examine the stressors in your life and purposefully make positive changes that impact your overall health. So I hope this is one of the many practices that I can leave you with. So as a recap, today we briefly discussed the diversity within our SEL frameworks and, and started off with a warm, welcoming, inclusive practice. Um, explore the topic of uh, culturally responsive teaching and reflection of our own identity, highlighting the ways that we can honor and address our students' lived experiences as part of our curriculum, and lastly, the area of self-care, because we as educators need to be in the right mindset in order to teach and reach our students more effectively. So I'd like to end today's webinar with another SEL closing practice. This practice allows students and teachers to reflect on their own learning and provides optimism and hope for the next day, even if students are, had a challenging day in the end. So ending with a positive, is, um, is something that's really important about the future. It develops a growth mindset and it allows students to know that they have something to look forward to in their education and that the process of their learning will continue. So here are the steps for a closing practice that I'd like to end with. Think about what you learned today. What can you use in the near future? And I say near because you don't wanna say, I'll use that sometime, right? Near future, meaning today, tomorrow, not a year from now, write it down on a sticky note. And I, I keep these by me all the time and I'm constantly putting little, little notes to self um, and play, post it someplace visible. So think about what you learned today. What is something that you can use in the near future? Yeah, let us know everybody. What is something that you can use in the near future? So Nala says, I would like to do more physical self-care, wonderful. Julie uh, loves the idea of the growth mindset and writing goals. Wonderful. Empathy interview. Gonzala says that they, she would like to do the empathy interview. The cubes, the me cubes from Mitchell. 
Kathy says, this workshop was very well organized and presented well. Thanks so much. Thank you for that nice comment. Thank you. Let's see. I will spend more time on self-care from Sabina. Eduardo says, the color-coded activity sounds like fun. And Lorena says, I learned that we as teachers should be confident of our students. That's a great point. Absolutely. Savink says, you have amazing slide designs. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. Thanks. Uh, many other people saying, thank you for a good session. Um, I'll plan to use it, use these ideas in the near future. So thank you so much for all those wonderful comments, everyone. And I think we all have learned a little bit about things that we can do for ourselves and our students. So thanks for sharing those ideas. And thank you so much, Kate. And I will thank you all for joining and sharing in this space with me. I am learning from all of you as well, from your ideas and, and what you bring to the table. And I greatly appreciate your contributions. So thank you so much to everyone that's, that's sharing in this space. And I will turn it back to Kate, thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Yes, our participants loved this session. Um, it's wonderful to hear all of these practical strategies for celebrating student identities, cultures, and subcultures using SEL and language learning activities. And also thanks for the reminder to take time for ourselves. Sometimes we busy teachers definitely need to do a little bit more of that and to incorporate self-care practices where we can. And as always, we'd like to thank you, our wonderful audience, for your engagement and participation today. Please continue to share your thoughts and ideas here on Zoom, social media, or with your viewing groups after the session ends.